Good evening, dear Medioscope viewers. Welcome to This Week in Turkey. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan and United States President Joe Biden held their first face-to-face -face bilateral meeting on June 14th on the sidelines of the NATO summit in Brussels, Belgium. The two leaders discussed critical topics such as the S-400s and Turkey's role in Afghanistan. Let us first watch our news video about the meeting and then our guest, Professor Sarhat Güvenç, will be joining us to evaluate the outcome. Speaking at the news conference following the 45-minute long meeting, Erdogan said, Through the occasion of the NATO summit, we got together with the U.S. President Joe Biden. We carried out an extensive meeting with Biden, with whom we have a friendship going back many years. We spoke with Biden and his team on the matters where we need effective collaboration. We agreed on maintaining direct dialogue channels between the two countries. Consequently, the meeting was extremely productive and sincere. We foresee that this paves the way to a productive collaboration based on respect and mutual interests in all areas. We do not think that there is anything unsolvable between Turkey-U.S. relations, said Erdogan. In accordance, speaking to reporters following the meeting, Biden said in the news conference that much of the meeting was one-on-one -on -one and that the interactions were positive and productive. We had detailed discussions about how to proceed on a number of issues. Our two countries have big agendas. Our teams are going to continue our discussions. I'm confident we will make real progress with Turkey and United States. Biden said. Erdogan and Biden have met numerous times in previous years, but June 14th was the first time that two leaders met as heads of state. As a vice president, Biden met with Erdogan as his counterpart frequently and made several trips to Turkey. However, since Biden became the U.S. president, he spoke with Erdogan only once in April to tell the Turkish president that the U.S. was recognizing the massacre of Armenians during the events of 1915 as a genocide. In the press conference held at the airport shortly before heading to Brussels, Erdogan had said that he would bring up the U.S.'s recognition of the events of 1915 as genocide in the upcoming meeting. This approach has upset us on a serious note. It is not right to continue without bringing this issue into daylight. Turkey is not a random country. Erdogan had said. However, after the meeting, when Erdogan was asked whether or not the topic of recognition of the Armenian genocide was discussed, Erdogan said, Thank God, the topic of April 24th was never brought up. Indicating that one of the most problematic topics among two countries was never discussed. During the Q&A part of the press conference, over a journalist's question on what was discussed about the S-400 defense system, Erdogan said, Regarding the topic of the S-400s and the F-35s, I expressed exactly what our stance on the issue was. I also expressed the possible joint steps we could take regarding the defense industry. Of course, this process does not end here. Our ministers will continue to carry out meetings. Erdogan further added that the two presidents decided to leave this issue to their defense and foreign ministries to discuss and that they will take steps according to what the ministries decide. This issue roots from Turkey's purchase of a multi-billion dollar Russian mobile surface-to-air missile system, which is seen as posing a risk to the NATO alliance, as well as the F-35s, America's most expensive weapon platform. The Trump administration had imposed Turkey with sanctions for purchasing S-400s as a NATO ally. Another topic on the agenda was a potential Turkish role on Afghanistan after the NATO withdrawal. As the U.S. is withdrawing from the region, Turkey, with more than 500 soldiers still in Afghanistan training security forces, now has the largest foreign military contingent there. The United States is in direct dialogue with Turkey on how to make an international airport in Kabul sustainable. White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan had announced a day before the NATO summit that Biden will offer Erdogan to give Turkey the role to maintain security in the Kabul airport in Afghanistan. Speaking on the issue of Afghanistan, Erdogan said, We clearly expressed our stance on Afghanistan to Biden. If Turkey's withdrawal from Afghanistan is not desired, and especially if we are wanted to provide a certain level of support, America's diplomatic and financial support carries a great importance for us. It is impossible to put the reality of the Taliban aside. We have also told them that we are thinking of siding with Pakistan and Hungary in Afghanistan. As of now, an agreement is at stake. There is not a problem at hand. For the continuation of the topics discussed in the Erdogan-Biden meeting, it is expected that the ministries of both countries will get in touch and continue the dialogue started by the two leaders. 
Professor Sarhat Gubanch, a professor of international relations at Kadir Has University, is joining us this evening to evaluate the outcome of the Biden Erdogan meeting. Hello, Professor Gubanch. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Shirin Aransoy. Thanks for having me. So we had uh, Biden and Erdogan had their first face to face meeting this week on the margins of the NATO summit. Um, and prior to this meeting, Erdogan and his media really hyped it up. Uh, Erdogan stating that this meeting would be a kind of a new chapter in US Turkish relations. Um, and at the end of the meeting, both leaders shared their positive thoughts regarding, uh, you know, uh, regarding their, uh, their, their meeting. So what were your expectations to begin with for this meeting? And how do you evaluate the out outcome um, in this regard? Well, my expectations were not as high as uh, the, the media that is very close to the ruling, uh, new ruling elite in Turkey. I'm afraid uh, because uh, the new administration in Washington had already sent out very strong signals as regards uh, to the, the character of the relationship they would be seeking with uh, President Erdogan and his, uh, his government, his administration in Turkey. Uh, Biden has maintained a very careful distance from Erdogan, uh, avoided one-to-one uh, -one, uh, settings that would give the impression that you know, he and Erdogan are on dealing with each other on personal uh, terms. Uh, the, the venue he picked is very telling in this regard because he preferred uh, to meet Erdogan very briefly indeed uh, by the standards of uh, uh, previous meetings uh, within a multilateral framework indeed. I mean, and this uh, framework or this venue indeed will help him deflect uh, criticism from domestic uh, circles in the United States, in particular in Senate, because it was a NATO summit and it was, it was nearly unavoidable for a US president uh, to see you know, uh, uh, the head of another member state. And in our case, that was President Erdogan of uh, Republic of Turkey. So that gave him the pretext and excuse to you know, have the occasion. And, and I think uh, the, the, the Biden administration will stick to this policy of avoiding you know, personalized Turkey only uh, settings uh, for future contacts. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it's, a, it's always a good thing in international politics uh, for heads of states and governments to establish direct communication with each other. You may be rivals, you may be partners, still communication is the essence of uh, uh, in improving relations, uh, solving the problems. And our, in, our, in our case, the main problem that stands uh, between uh, Turkey and the United States is the issue of uh, S-400 air defense missiles Turkey had procured from Russia. Mm -hmm. And the problem stands. Uh, the parties maintain their positions. They're entrenched in their respective positions. However, which is a very interesting, again, uh, indication, and it also marks a deviation from Erdogan's personal approach to decision making. You know, the two leaders have decided to refer to matter to committees, right? To be dealt with at the technical level. Well, this is uh, a rudimentary reinstitutionalization in Turkish American relations. You know, Erdogan used to deal with US presidents directly and personally to uh, cut uh, or to handle matters. And that was his personal style. So this agreement, whether it will bear fruit or not is, a, is another issue, but this agreement in and of itself is a deviation from Erdogan's uh, personalized diplomatic practices. Mm -hmm. So this is again, because uh, in that regard, in the Biden administration managed to, get, managed to get Erdogan on the track they preferred to put their bilateral relations with Turkey on. That is a very institu highly institutionalized uh, frameworks, uh, framework for, to deal with the issues of divergence and convergence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not expecting, I'm not 
very optimistic about a positive outcome out of such uh, technical uh, negotiations, folks, as regards to the future of the S-400. But in diplomacy, talking is better than, you know, arguing, fighting, quarreling. Therefore, uh, there is room uh, for improve, there is room for uh, settling that issue. Uh, however, uh, for the Americans, uh, it's very clear that S 400s represent an, an existential issue for Turkish US relations. And once your principal ally frames an issue like this, you know, it's very difficult to get around such a wording, I'm afraid. So uh, mm -hmm. it's an uphill struggle for Ankara. Mm -hmm. to solve uh, the S-400 issue to the satisfaction of the Biden administration in Washington, D.C. Yeah, just to follow up on that, Professor Divanj, uh, I mean, as you mentioned, now the relations are, are much more institutionalized. And uh, since Biden took office, as a matter of fact, this was something that was uh, repeatedly um, said that, you know, the relation that Erdogan had with Trump would not would not um, be the case uh, when it comes to Biden. And as a result of this meeting, as you also mentioned, uh, uh, you know, the defense ministers uh, and a committee and so forth were going to meet on the issue and inform the state leaders. However, um, I mean, how can the, a solution regarding the S 400s be indefinitely postponed? It seems, you know, there were so many kind of proposals put to the table and, you know, there were no developments in that regard. So how long can this kind of, you know, you know, not ignoring perhaps the problem, but how how can how lo how much longer can this issue be postponed in that sense? Well, uh, you know, Ankara made a very smart move indeed and created a new stake, you know, to place or to derail the the focus of or to shift the focus of Turkish U.S. relations a bit away from the S four hundreds to the issue of. Afghanistan, the US and NATO withdrawal from Afghanistan, okay? Uh, it's a common EU diplomatic practice is to leave matters uncertain, which is called uh, constructive ambiguity. So I see a hint of this in this, uh, how should I, interim solution. You know, let the ministers and the technical committees deal with issue. And in the meantime, I mean, let's discuss this. and. Uh, this was a smart move on the part of Ankara. I mean, as regards to kind of uh, uh, distracting the United States a bit away from the S-400s, because mm -hmm. they remain the crux of the, the, the relations, but uh, Ankara created, uh, came up with a new stake. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, if this issue, the, the issue of uh, Turkey controlling the Kabul International Airport, is uh, finalized. So this will give Ankara a breathing space to tackle the S-400 issue more constructively in an uncertain future day, uh, date. While you know the parties will be busy with the modalities of Turkish takeover of uh, the Kabul International Airport as uh, the rear guard ally, uh, which I prefer to call Turkey's position as regards to the issue of Afghanistan while the rest of the, the allies uh, are, you know, uh, rushing to withdraw their soldiers, troops out of Afghanistan. Turkey is willing to move in to commit more and more troops, combat and support troops to maintain this uh, strategic airhead, which is the Afghanistan International Air Airport for and on behalf of the allies. Uh, therefore, it seems that for the foreseeable future, we will be debating, discussing about uh, the Turkish takeover or Turkish control of the Afghanistan International Airport. And depending on the level of uh, goodwill and positive environment this Turkish move creates, Ankara hopes to be able to solve the S-400 issue in a manner more acceptable for the Turkish public opinion, for President Erdogan himself, because it's a uh, personal issue, and in a manner that would not uh, turn off President Putin of Russia, because I mean the the silent partner in this uh, quandrum quandrum uh, is Russia. 
we have so Ankara has to be considerate of Russia's concerns, and therefore uh, the, the Russians Russian involvement or Russian presence as a as a party to this issue indeed uh, constrains uh, Erdogan's latitude for action. You know, it imposes structural limits on his flexibility to settle the issue. Uh, to, uh, to the satisfaction, to the total satisfaction of the United States. And in a future date, you know, uh, uh, Ankara again, probably is thinking that they may, they may come up with new leverages to be traded with the S-400s. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, coming back to this uh, offer that Turkey has made to operate and protect the Kabul airport, I mean, other than it being a strategy to kind of derail the focus of the meeting and, you know, to, to uh, gain some time in relation to the S-400s, what kind of advantages could it have for Turkey politically and strategically to, uh, to be kind of operating and protecting this airport? Uh, let me uh, clarify one point, indeed. I I didn't mean to imply that Turkey made that move just to, you know, uh, distract the United States. No, I mean, uh, it, Turkey has other motives in volunteering for such a mission. But uh, one of the outcomes will be, of course, you know, kind of easing the burden on the relations of the S-400 issue. Well, for a number of reasons, I think, uh, Turkey uh, sees uh, how should I say, some benefit, you know, sees such a mission will serve its national interest, first and foremost, because, you know, uh, controlling and operating a strategically important airport in Afghanistan, in Central Asia, is very much in tune with Turkey's recent ambitions to have overseas bases, naval and air bases. You know, because such bases are considered as uh, symbols of Turkey's influence at a global level. And they are also uh, considered to enhance Turkey's voice and role in international affairs. So that is, this is pretty much in line with Turkey's uh, uh, overseas ambitions. Second, Turkey is counting on its uh, cultural and historical heritage in Afghanistan, you know, Turkey's, Turkey's associ military association with Afghanistan has a longer history than NATO's involvement in Afghanistan after 9-11. So Turkey is uh, counting on uh, this heritage and is, uh, count is expecting that this uh, heritage will gives, a, gives Turkey a distinct advantage over NATO, other NATO members to remain present in such a highly contested environment. So Turkey is counting on its uh, uh, historical ties with, uh, with Afghanistan. And finally, of course, uh, in the last couple of years, I mean, Turkey has been at odds with a number of major NATO members from France to Germany, Greece, and the United States. Well, uh, this, you know, assuming such a critical mission indeed will help Turkey uh, uh, resist or will, uh, will enhance Turkey's uh, resilience within the alliance because it will be very difficult to take cheap shots at a member state like, Tur like Turkey, which is fulfilling a very crucial function for the entire alliance. Uh, so these are the motivations uh, from, uh, uh, from Ankara's perspective, I gather. And also all these, you know, when uh, all these combined, I mean, such a move will serve both national interest and also will uh, help Turkey uh, maintain uh, a credible uh, uh, status within the NATO alliance. Um, yeah, thank you for summarizing that, Professor Givanch. Another kind of problematic issue that I, I wanted to ask you about was the recognition of the Armenian genocide. So prior to the meeting, Erdogan did say that he would lay the issue to the table. Yet after the meeting, he commented that the issue had thankfully not come up. So how do you evaluate this in terms of diplomacy? Uh, well, uh, probably for a number of reasons, President Erdogan felt compelled to express his relief 
because the issue was not brought up by either side during their meeting. Uh, well, we don't know exactly what happened and what kind of uh, issues were uh, discussed in that 40 minutes, but probably President Erdogan as a smart politician had sensed that bringing up the issue of Pre uh, Biden's recognition of 1915 events as genocide could have uh, poisoned uh, the, the meeting very early on and it could not have lasted, uh, it could have lasted uh, a short, uh, it could have turned out to be a short meeting which would not have gone down very well uh, with uh, domestic public opinion in Turkey and also internationally because Erdogan needed to show that he could establish dialogue with the new US president. And because uh, the US side did not have any expressed intention to uh, elaborate on that issue, probably uh, they better left it unsaid for that meeting. However, uh, the damage remains uh, in the relations, but uh, obviously it was not as great as we had all anticipated for years because uh, Turkish governments, Turkish diplomats had put up great efforts to forestall any attempt or any uh, expression by any US president uh, of the term genocide to uh, define what, to identify what happened in 1915. So uh, despite uh, the Herculean effort, which, fa which had failed in the end, obviously the President Erdogan and Biden are intent on moving ahead. And it seems that the issue was left behind. Uh, in the long run, it may be, uh, it may be beneficial for both sides to leave that issue behind. Uh, but uh, we will see uh, again in coming decades, its legal impact, which is another issue. So politically, probably Erdogan saw no, no uh, reason, no point in raising the issue, uh, which had been settled for the Americans uh, for the time being. Mm -hmm. Um, and lastly, Professor Givant, I'd like to ask you about the, the this issue of democracy, freedom of speech, and uh, and human rights. Uh, since Biden has taken office, he has underlined the importance of democracy in U.S.'s foreign policy. Um, you know, to contain authoritarian regimes and so forth. And um, you know, in the past few months, there have been statements issued by the State Department uh, in relation to Turkey's violation of such principles relating to the Boğaziçi University protests, for example, as well as the release of Osman Kavala. Um, but again, this is something I don't think that has come up in this albeit short meeting between the two leaders. Um, and, you know, when we when we look back at the, you know, recent events, you know, Turkey has not really taken any steps on this in this regard. And on the contrary, what with the um, release of mob leader Sedat Peker's videos, we see now that the depth of corruption and shady relations that the current government has been implicating it mm -hmm. implicated in so do you think that there will be pressure in this regard in the near future will biden stand by his words with regards to democratic values in the international arena well i mean yes he made his stand clear and he what he had to do that to put a distance between himself and trump which had no regard whatsoever uh to the human rights uh, promotion of democracy issues. But on the other hand, uh, Biden is burdened with the American, uh, decades of American interventionism for in the name of promoting democracy and human rights across the globe, you know. Uh, and that adventure ended really badly for the United States. Therefore, uh, US has a structural problem Biden is no longer standing on a moral high ground compared to other nations because uh, his nation uh, is burdened with uh, uh, the, the, the military interventionism of the last 20 years. That, that we have to uh, uh, set straight. Second of all, well, uh, the United States is, a, is caught in a dilemma. It's yet again, it's on the throes of a geopolitical rivalry with China and Russia. And these two, uh, the latter countries, you know, China and Russia are 
do, they do not care about human rights or democracy promotion. So he has to reconcile uh, uh, promotion of human rights and democracy with the geopolitical competition. This is not an easy task. And the case in point is Turkey, because I mean, Turkey, uh, even uh, as a strategic ally, you know, not, not a, a, an ally sharing, you know, adhering to the values of the alliance is important in that rivalry. Okay, it has not to be lost to the other side. But on the other hand, I mean, uh, it's a, uh, NATO is an alliance of uh, democracies and Turkey indeed has to improve according to the American administration, its democratic credentials. How can you do that? Well, Biden administration paid lip service. You know, uh, indeed, I mean, they, the, the State Department made a statement, right? Issued a statement as regards to Osman Kavala, et cetera. But the problem is again, structural, you know, this was not the job of the United States for, uh, for the past two decades. Uh, it was uh, EU's, so to speak, responsibility to, to, pr to promote democracy and human rights in Turkey. And, to, to do that, uh, the, the European Union uh, had conditionality and it had instruments, right? Benchmarks. So for meeting each benchmark, Turkey was rewarded with some progress in the relations. Well, the EU is no longer in the picture. The United States cannot come up with sim a similar conditionality because it doesn't have the means and instruments. And therefore, uh, I'm afraid, uh, uh, Turkey's uh, domestic politics will lose, may lose its significance even for the Biden administration in the coming de decades as this geopolitical rivalry intensifies and as Washington uh, will need more and need to enlist more and more allies uh, to its side. So uh, what we will see, we continue to see is you know, a U.S. administration talking the talk, but not walking the walk. Mm -hmm. Professor Sarhat Givanch, thank you so much for having joined us today. Thank you. On June 15th, the Kobani trial continued at the Ankara 22nd Heavy Penal Court in Sinjam Prison Courthouse, where the court ruled for the release of defendants Ayhan Bigan, Barfin Özgü Köse, Jan Memish and Jihan Erdal with an international travel ban. In the midst of these trials, an armed attack was made into the People's Democratic Party Izmir Municipality building and one person was killed. Known as Kobani incidents or the events of 6-8 October, the Kobani trial relates to the protests and violence that took place in 2014. There are 108 defendants from the People's Democratic Party while 28 people have been arrested pending trial, there are judicial control measures on six people and warrants against 75 people. In the trial over the Kobani protests of October 6-8, 2014, politicians faced life imprisonment aggravated 38 times. 17 people were detained on October 2, 2020, under the Kobani protests investigation conducted by Ankara Chief Public Prosecutor's Office. Out of those 17 who were detained, former Kars City Mayor Ayhan Bilyan, along with HDP Central Executive Board Member Barfin Özgü Köse, Press Officer for the HDP Jan Memish, and Turkish PhD student from Canada Cihan Erdal were released. Ayhan Bilyan, the former mayor of Kars province and a member of HDP, had announced his resignation on Twitter after being detained as part of an investigation against HDP. Under the investigation, Ayhan Bilgan had been removed from his position and was replaced by a government-appointed mayor, Vali Türker Öksüz. Many mayors from the HDP who were democratically elected to their positions were removed by the Turkish state due to allegations of having links to the PKK terror organization. The Kobani incident started after the Syrian border town of Kobani was captured by ISIS in early October 2014. Demonstrations were a result of the failed expectation for the Turkish government to protest Syrian Kurds from the ISIS militants. This conflict stems from Turkey's ban on weapon transfer to the YPG during the ISIS siege. However, what ignited the protests further was the HDP party's call to go out to the streets. As the masses flooded 
into the streets in Kurdish-majority southeastern provinces, as well as Ankara and Istanbul, protests became violent. According to the Human Rights Association's report, during the Kobani demonstrations, 46 people died, 682 were injured, and 323 people were arrested between October 6 and 8 in 2014. During the course of these events, President Erdogan made statements indicating that they equated PKK with ISIS and accused the HDP for maintaining links with PKK. PKK is listed as a terrorist organization by the EU, the US, and Turkey. The former HDP co-chairs Selatin Demirtas and Figan Yüksekta have been in prison since November of 2016 due to terror-related charges. In 2019, a new case file was opened against them, which accused them of inciting the Kobani protests of 2014. In other news relating to the HDP, an armed attack targeted the HDP building in Izmir on June 17. The attacker, Onur Gencer, entered in the building and opened fire and killed a party employee named Denis Poiras. According to the statement from the Izmir governor's office, The person named OG, who had resigned from a healthcare position, entered the HDP municipal building and killed DP with a gun. The suspect has been arrested and the incident is being investigated in all parts. A picture from Genja's Instagram account showed him in Syria's Aleppo in a military uniform. He was also seen making the gesture of the Grey Wolves, a far-right group that the European Parliament recently called on the European Union to add to its terrorist list. The statement made from the HDP's official Twitter account read, Our building was set on fire. We have personnel inside the building. Both the perpetrator and the abettor of the attack is apparent. The government and the agitators are the ones responsible for any negativity. HDP co-chair Mithat Sanjar told reporters that the actual aim of the assailant was to kill more people. There was a meeting scheduled for today that was going to be attended by 40 people. It was cancelled at the last minute. The aim of the assailant was to carry out a massacre. Sanjar said. While the Turkish public awaited in anticipation for mob leader Sedat Peker's 10th video this past Sunday, the video did not come, leading to the public to wonder if something had happened to Peker. Adding to the confusion, several pro-government social media accounts claimed that the National Intelligence Organization conducted an, op an operation to nab Pekar in Dubai. Pekar started tweeting following hours of unsubstantiated rumors, saying that an operation wasn't carried out since he was not a sought individual. Despite the fact that a new video was not released this week, new developments relating to Pekar's revelations regarding the shady relations between mafia, media, and politics in Turkey have occurred this week. In his last video, Pekar had revealed that fugitive businessman Sezgin Baran Korkmaz was informed by Interior Minister Suleyman Soylu that there was an inquiry against him, which prompted Korkmaz to leave the country. Korkmaz is accused of money laundering and fraud. Pekar further stated that Habertürk journalist Beis Atesh was playing the middleman between Korkmaz and the officials to resolve his problem. While Atesh denied these allegations last week, this week another Habertürk columnist, Sevilay Yilman, revealed that she had heard three minutes of a 12-minute long audio recording between Atesh and Korkmaz confirming Pekar's allegations. Here are the details. Habertür columnist Sevilay Yilman disclosed the conversation between fugitive businessman Sezgin Baran Korkmaz and Habertür journalist Veis Ateş, where Ateş asks Korkmaz for 10 million euros. Sevilay Yilman said that the entire audio recording, where Ateş asks for 10 million euros from Korkmaz, was 12 minutes long and Korkmaz made her listen to a three-minute part of this recording. Yilman said in her column on June 15, I was in shock. I couldn't believe it. Yilma said she called the Habertürk management after listening to the audio recording, informing them of her knowledge on the blackmail. Yilma, in today's article, conveyed the details of the conversation as follows. In short, in the recording, Veis Atesh says, I know it hurts a lot. You want to burn everything down. You want to go and speak out everywhere. I understand what you're going through. You are right. You want to be reunited with your spouse, family, children. You want to return to your country as if nothing had happened. I'm in Ankara. I realize that there's a clique and lobby messing with you. 
But it is possible to turn things around with these people. Thereupon, SBK says, Brother, I am in the right legally. But still, tell me how can I turn things around? Vay Satish answers, They expect you to show your sincerity first. To which SBK responds, How will I show them? Atesh then says, You will send the amount they demanded. SBK response in the recording is, Let's say I sent 10 million euros. But what if we can't reach these people later on? What will happen then? Atesh responds, Don't worry, I am the arbitrator and guarantor of both sides. The money will stay with me until the job is done. Journalist Fatih Altail also penned an article where he alleged that Korkmaz had called him, accusing Atesh of blackmailing him, asking for 10 million euros to play the middleman between Korkmaz and officials. Altail stated in his article that the allegations can be categorized as criminal charges. After denying the allegations, Vais Atesh gave in his resignation to Habartürk on June 17th. And now for the coronavirus-related developments of the week. According to the data released by the Ministry of Health, the daily number of new cases on June 17th has been announced as 5,904 and the number of deaths as 62. These numbers have led to the total number of cases to become 5,354,153 and the death toll to become 49,012. According to Health Minister Fahrettin Koja, as of June 11th, all lawyers without age restrictions, food production and distribution industries, restaurant, cafe employees and hairdressers have been included in the vaccination program. Shortly after, employees in local and interprovincial transportation industries, couriers and taxi drivers were added to the program. On June 13th, Koja stated that the age of inoculation dropped to 40. The next day, he announced all employees and civil servants registered with the Social Security Institution were eligible to get vaccinated. In a statement released on June 15th, he announced, We just reached the target of 1 million doses of vaccines. As of June 17th, vaccination appointments will be available for all citizens over the age of 35. Medioscope correspondent Zeynep Timurleng Pozut spoke with Professor Dr. Kayahan Pala from Uludağ University's Faculty of Medicine, Department of Public Health, on the vaccination process in Turkey so far. According to Dr. Pala, If we look at the proportion of our citizens who have had two doses, we are still around 17%. We know the BioNTech vaccine can be more effective against new alarming variants only if two doses are provided. Therefore, we need to move quickly towards our goal to vaccinate 120 million people with a daily vaccination rate of 1 million. Vaccines with high protection rates such as BioNTech are still very effective against alarming variants. Therefore, if we can vaccinate 60 million citizens with two doses in a short time, then we can enter the last quarter of the year a bit more peacefully. It is too early to talk about a third dose, both in Turkey and the world. There are two reasons for this. One. We have limited scientific knowledge about the time frame vaccines, including Sinovac, can effectively protect us against variants. Two, while many people in the world and Turkey have not yet had their first dose, the discussion of a third dose may only be brought up for health workers who are in high risk groups. If one has gotten both doses of BioNTech vaccine and two weeks have passed from the date of the second dose, one can remove their mask in an outdoor environment where physical distance is maintained. But for now, it is too early to take off the mask if one is inside. 95 out of every 100 people who get the mRNA vaccine do not get the disease. Ones who catch the disease suffer very mildly and reduce their risk of dying to almost 0%. It is not rational to reject the use of this tool. The UEFA 2020 is underway. Turkey is playing in Group A, but so far the results have disappointed football fans. Here are the details. Turkey, on June 16, suffered a 2-0 loss to Wales in the UEFA Euro 2020 Group A Game 2. Previously, Turkey has lost to Italy 3-0. Wales has 4 points and is at the top of Group A. Italy has 3 points and will take on Switzerland on Wednesday in Game 2. Switzerland is in 3rd with 1 point. 
Turkey, who respectively lost to Italy and Wales, is at the bottom without any points. Turkey's next game will be against Switzerland on Sunday, June 20. That's all from this week in Turkey. See you next Friday at 9 p.m. Good night.